Greetings gamers, game enthusiasts and game developers. In this new series, you will see me building an entirely new game from the ground up and I'll be giving you an exclusive behind the scenes look at every step of the process. On the way, you'll find out about the ins and outs of game creation. We'll be diving into the nitty gritty details of coding and making things work in Unity 3D. If you're a game developer, this will give you the tools and knowledge to bring your own game ideas to life. And I'll show you some really amazing tricks that will make game development so much easier. If you're a gamer, you will see how a game like this works under the hood. So there's something here for everyone. Let's make a game. The first question I always start with is, what is this game about? As in, what is the key idea or the key game mechanic? The thing you'd include in any one-sentence summary of the game. That is rarely a genre or a class of game. I want to make an MMORPG isn't a core concept. It tells you nothing about the game, does it? For this game, the core concept is from an old board game called The Awful Green Things from Outer Space. And by old, I mean 1979. I'll put a link to Board Game Geek into the description and you can find a couple videos about the game here on YouTube as well. I don't want to remake the game perfectly, not just because I'd have to wrangle with Steve Jackson games or TSR or whoever owns the right today, but it is my inspiration for the core gameplay. You play the crew of a spaceship that is infested by strange aliens. One of the most important game mechanics of the board game that I will copy is that at the beginning of each game you do not know what effect the various weapons, tools and other things on your ship have on the aliens and these effects get randomly assigned new for every game. This gives the game an element of unpredictability and ensures that no two games are the same. Plus it's a ton of fun because some effects actually help the aliens. Oops. As I want to pay homage to a board game, I've decided to make this a 2D game. That will be interesting for me as well, as I've made mostly 3D games so far. It's also clear that it will be a turn-based game, as the player controls many crew members. Now if you prefer to just play the game instead of watching me build it, someone else beat me to it. By 40 years. Space Station Zulu came out in 1982. You can find it on AbandonWare sites. Alright, with these basics decided, I already know that I'll need at least three game elements. The crew, the aliens and items. Good. Let's turn on Unity and get started with a new 2D URP project. It needs a name. Oh yes. Did you notice I didn't mention the name of the game so far? That's because I had the idea, but no brilliant idea for a name. So after a bit of brainstorming and messing around with a couple stupid titles, I settled on Creatures of Hyperspace. That will do for now, at least as a working title. Maybe I'll change it later on. The first thing I'll do is add three assets that I use in every project. I'll put links to them in the description. Odin Inspector makes it easier to work with variables and properties in the inspector. I don't use its most powerful features, but just a few annotations really make developing so much more comfortable. Script Inspector 3 is for all of you who, like me, are no friends of Visual Studio. It lets me edit C-sharp scripts right in the editor, and I find that speeds up my workflow dramatically. Finally, Rewired is what you should use for all input handling if you don't want that Unity input system drives you crazy. In addition to those, I also use my own package Observables in most projects. It's a scriptable object-based event system with a few cute features like tracing variables and being inspectable in the editor. Check out the linked video here to learn more about this package. Everything else I need to get started is included in the 2D URP core. Alright, I have my game idea, now I need to figure out how the game will work. After some consideration I decided to use a grid-based approach and the Unity tilemaps system. This is the first deviation from the board game, but more suitable to what I have in mind. Also, it allows me to easily get graphics, either by buying a tilemap asset or hiring a graphics artist. But for now, I'll just set up some really basic placeholder art. My tilemap setup has several layers, organized as individual tilemaps. I may add more of them in the future. I have one tilemap for the floor, that makes it very easy to both define and check via code if a grid square belongs to the map at all or not. For now, I have only one tile, a simple white sprite for this. One tilemap for walls and other impassable areas. Again, just one placeholder sprite for now. Putting this on its own tilemap lets me combine the colliders, 
by checking here and here. Something I'm sure I will use later on when beam weapons or line of sight come into play. One tile map is for all kinds of interactive elements in the map. I'll put doors here, but also any kind of machinery computers players can use and other stuff. And one tile map for walkable squares, which will be used for visualizing pathfinding later. Splitting these into different tile maps gives me a few advantages, the main one being able to use the has tile at position function to do logic checks, without having to define and check tile parameters. There's a few important things about Unity tile maps that make things easier once you get them. The first is that tile definitions are scriptable objects. If you don't use scriptable objects in your Unity projects, you're missing out one of the most powerful Unity features. Go and watch a few videos on scriptable objects. I'm linking one here. The second is that tile definitions apply to all tiles on a map. You can inherit from the tile base or tile class and write your own tile definitions and add values there, but they will be the same for all tiles, and if you change them, then all tiles will have the new value. That is useful for something like movement costs, say, sand tiles are always more expensive than stone tiles. However, I want tiles like doors, machines and so on, and they need individual values or states. I did experiment for quite a long time with doors and how to store the open or closed state and switch things around to make them block or allow movement depending on that. In the end, I went the lazy way, defined one tile for the closed and one for the open state and when the door is opened or closed, switch out the tiles. So for this case, I don't actually store the door state in the tile. I still want to be able to handle individual tiles for my interactable elements, so here's how I did it. The base interaction tile class inherits from the tile maps dot tile class and for now just adds an interaction cost value and a function to refresh itself. The main purpose of this class is that I can generalize all interactive elements of the map. An interface class would have been another option, but there are actually only a few shared methods and I'm not a big fan of interfaces, so inheritance was my choice. Note that the base interaction tile class is defined as abstract. It only serves as a blueprint for child classes. The more specific door tile class only has a reference to another door tile representing the other state. So on the open door tile this will reference the closed door tile and vice versa. Then there is a door prefab that is assigned in the door tile. The prefab is just a transform with a door controller component. The advantage of this prefab is that the tile map will instantiate individual game objects for every tile. This gives us the ability to have access to individual doors instead of just the generic door tile. This is why we need a game object here, even if it is very simple. The door controller on the prefab inherits from another abstract class for shared functions, we'll look at that one in a moment. With the shared functions in the parent class, the door controller only needs to handle the actual door functionality and this button annotation is a feature of Udin Inspector which gives me a button in the inspector to call it. That way I can easily and quickly debug the code without having to write some other test code that calls it. Let's look at that base object controller. Like with the base interaction tile class, this is an abstract class. It defines the interface and shared functions for all objects. Via the prefab it is connected to a tile on the map. The current grid location property is where some of the magic happens. This allows all objects on my map to know not just their world space transform position, but also their position on the grid. The start and on destroy methods take care of adding and removing the object to my local objects list on the object manager. And finally, I defined a clicked function that will be called when the object is clicked on by the player. We'll get to the crew controller in the next episode. Note how this set tile method will be called on the interactable tile map when the door controller sets the tile in the switch method. Setting the tile will then call the refresh function on the tile script, which will make sure the graphics are updated. All the parts of the puzzle fit together. Excellent! If you check the Unity forum and other sources, many people will recommend using game objects placed in the scene view and not having things like doors on the tile map at all. That is certainly a way to do it, however, I wanted to handle as much as possible in the tile maps. First it will make it much easier to create and edit maps. Secondly, I can more easily scale the entire grid up and down when later on I decide about the graphics. And thirdly, 
I just wanted to. So all the game objects on the map, whether they are doors, items or characters, will know their grid position and be accessible via the grid. That means I need some way to access them. I could use tags and the find by tag function, but that searches the entire hierarchy and most of the elements on there are not what I'm looking for. Instead, I will implement a list of all objects and search them by grid position. I'm using a master singleton pattern. This is another standard programming thing, so if you don't know about singletons, stop the video and watch a few videos about singletons. Some people say that singletons are an anti-pattern, and they do have a certain ugliness to them, which is why I think the master singleton pattern is a good solution. Not my idea, other people came up with it, I got it from Thousand Aunt, here's a link to his video. What is a master singleton? It's a singleton that serves as a service lookup for all other global services. Instead of having a mess of singletons all over the place, in my game everything is on game controller instance something. For example, wherever I need a reference to the grid, I can get it with game controller instance grid instead of doing ugly find whatever calls. With the master singleton in place, it's easy to keep a list of all my objects, whether instantiated as part of a tile or as pure game objects. Simply create a simple object manager that stores a list of objects and every object adds itself on start and removes itself on destroy. Easy! And since I have a global reference to the grid, every object can access that to convert its world position to a grid position. Voila! List of all objects that can be searched by grid positions. Let's make a function for that. Note that this assumes that only one object can occupy a grid square. For my game that will always be the case. If in your game objects can pile up, then you'll need to return a list or array. There are other ways to implement this. I could save CPU cycles at the cost of memory by having a two-dimensional array. Or use a hash table. I went with this approach because it is extremely easy both to implement and to understand. And for the game I have in mind, the number of objects to search will be a few dozen at most, so performance isn't an issue. Brilliant! I have a tile map that I can access with all the built-in tools, and aside from visuals, I can access it as data and understand which parts of the map are walkable, where doors are, and so on. Join me next time as we tackle the core mechanics of player input and movement to bring the game to life. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you're the first to know when new episodes are released. And a thumbs up would be most welcome.